this much improved Yeti, Skoda has tried to provide us with a more credible family crossover. It's smarter and more capable than before and also comes with an off-road orientated outdoor body style that you'll have to have to take up the option of the brand's much improved 4x4 system. Though this segment's more demanding than it used to be, this Skoda's tougher too. You can see why so many people like it. Being a motoring writer means being constantly asked for new car advice. Once dispensed, it's routinely ignored, of course, but that doesn't stop you being cornered in the kitchen at parties and having the strengths and weaknesses of a short list of cars reeled off to you. For family types, the usual advice is buy a Golf before making a swift exit. And while it's certainly hard to go wrong with Volkswagen's hardy perennial, I recently had one chap who seemed to have a more considered list of buying criteria. I told him to buy a Skoda Yeti. Why? Well, he wanted an affordable, practical family car that was well built, a bit different and reasonably stylish, but not something that would label him as an aging hipster in denial. He also needed a five door hatch that would lug the kids around safely and could easily be driven to a ski resort, though he hated SUVs like Freelanders, RAV4s and such like to school run mum. In meeting these kinds of needs, the Yeti fills a very specific niche and it's none the worse for it, especially in the revised first generation form we're gonna look at here. True, this facelifted car hasn't changed a great deal, but then there's an argument that it didn't need to. The Yeti, as you'll probably know, is one of those SUV style family hatchbacks on growth hormones the industry refers to as crossovers. These days these come in two sizes with the smaller ones derived from super minis and the bigger Qashqai class models based on focus sized family hatchbacks. The Yeti hails from the larger species but is priced and sized to be able to tempt buyers shopping in either category which probably accounts for the phenomenal success of the original version we first saw in 2009. Well over a quarter of a million Yetis were pounding global roads by the time this updated first generation model was launched early in 2014, setting the brand well on its way to its target of achieving 1.5 million annual sales worldwide across all its models by 2018. This improved version though has a much tougher sales task on its hands than its predecessor. In the last few years, the crossover class has exploded and almost every mainstream maker now either offers such a car or is developing one. The result is a tightly fought sector in which all of this Yeti's most direct rivals are either completely new or substantially revised. Hence the Skoda response that we're gonna look at here. The smarter looks, the extra equipment, the more efficient optional 4x4 drivetrain and the division of the range into either standard or more SUV orientated outdoor models. Will it be enough to keep this car as a sales favourite in its segment? Let's find out. If you're familiar with original Skoda Yeti models, or indeed any kind of modern crossover class car, then you'll find few surprises at the wheel of this one. Which means that there's the usual slightly elevated SUV style driving position with excellent all-round visibility, but at the same time a vehicle that will handle like any conventional golf-sized family hatch, quick to change direction with surprisingly little body roll for something this tall. There's loads of grip, the ride is firm but comfortable, and the electric power steering is direct and accurate, if a little artificial feeling. Drivers who'd normally struggle to adjust to a conventional small SUV would quickly find themselves driving this car smoothly and swiftly. As for engines, well, a little frustratingly perhaps, the standout units are the ones that can't be ordered with the 4x4 system, a surprisingly large proportion of Yeti buyers want. 
The power plants in question both develop 105 PS, a 1.2 litre TSI petrol and a 1.6 litre TDI diesel, and on the face of it deliver very comparable levels of performance, with the rest of the 62 mile an hour sprint achievable in around 12 seconds, en route to a maximum of around 110 miles an hour. In practice, the diesel will feel much the more eager of the two, given that it develops around 60% more pulling power. Its raised 1400 kilogram brake towing limit will make it better for towers too. Having said that, if you don't do too many long trips, don't lug a trailer around, and are likely to be using your Yeti maybe for shopping and the school run, the Willing Petrol 1.2 will more than sufficiently meet your needs. Nice though, isn't it, to over-specify for them. After all, you might not ever use that diver's watch you bought that'll function in water up to 100 meters deep, but it's nice to have just in case you ever fall in the bath. In the same way, a 4x4 system seems an appropriate indulgence. You'll feel good about adding into this car. Some Qashqai class crossovers can seem rather ridiculous with four-wheel drive, but this one seems set up rather better to suit it, especially in this revised guise. As before, you almost always have to have a 2.0-litre TDI diesel engine to take advantage of this option. Though you can order the base 110 PS version of this unit with two-wheel drive, I can't really see why you'd ever want to, given the way that such a spec would duplicate what's an offer from the similarly priced, equally pokey and much more efficient 1.6-litre diesel variant. So, think of a Yeti with a 2.0-litre diesel as being that rarest of things, a 4x4 crossover class car that can actually venture a little off the beaten track. You'll be able to order it in three states of tune, with either 110, 140 or 170 PS outputs. Now I'm trying the 140 PS version, a variant that, like the top 170 PS model, can also be ordered with the extra cost DSG automatic gearbox I'm using here, though for diesel buyers it's a rather slow-witted six-speed system rather than the more efficient seven-speed setup that's an option for 1.2 litre petrol customers. It's just as well then that performance with this 2 litre TDI 140 model is a little more sprightly than it is with the 110 PS 4x4 variant. The 0 to 62 mile an hour sprint time for manual transmission improving from 12.2 to 9.9 .9 seconds and the maximum speed increasing from 108 to 118 miles an hour. For the top 2 litre TDI 170 4x4 Yeti, the respective figures are 8.4 seconds and 125 miles an hour. These figures are virtually identical to those you'll get from the only petrol powered 4x4 Yeti model, the rare 160 PS 1.8 TSI variant, a version that's expensive, inefficient and best ignored. So if you do want a 4x4 Yeti and you've sifted out the right engine option, how will it fare on the rough stuff? Well, reasonably well is the answer, thanks to a more efficient fifth generation Haldex clutch system that's lighter, smoother and more efficient than before. As ever, the setup isn't designed to deliver fully fledged permanent all wheel drive, the kind of thing that you get on say a Subaru or a proper SUV. No, instead, you've a layout that most of the time, with fuel saving in mind, diverts only about 10% of power to the rear axle. Should the rear axle mounted electrohydraulic clutch detect wheel slip, however, the clever electronics are capable of directing as much as 100% of torque rearwards, the proportion being adjusted to suit the conditions. Conditions that'll need to be more forest track and grassy field than Serengeti or Rubicon Trail, thanks to the limited 180 millimetres of ground clearance on offer. Approach and departure angles are limited too, though thanks to the revised bumpers fitted to the outdoor body style 4x4 Yeti customers have to have, uh, those approach and departure angles are quite impressive for a crossover, rated at 19 degrees at the front and 32 degrees at the rear. There's no way of significantly improving any of this so that really gnarly trails could be attempted. Not even if you opt for the extra cost rough road package fitted to the car I have here, though the pack in question does uh, provide extra underbody protection for the engine and various drive ancillaries. 
go for this and you're certainly going to also want to have your Yeti fitted with the off-road button that's either standard or optional depending on the trim level that you've selected. Now you'll find it in front of the gear stick at the base of the dashboard here and a single prod offers a one-shot way of instantly switching all your Yeti's electronic drive systems into off-road mode. Don't worry, that doesn't mean that you'll have to be some kind of experienced mud plugger to control it all. In fact, you're not required to do anything at all, except admire the fact that mounting a slippery kerb outside the school gates or dealing with a sloping snowy driveway will be markedly easier with the off-road button activated. That's because you'll be getting extra grip from the ASR traction control and EDS differential lock systems and unintended wheel spin will be dialed out by an uphill start assist system that restricts your engine speed to 2,500 RPM. Other benefits of this package include a downhill assist function that maintains a stable speed down steep slippery slopes and ABS tweaked for off piste use to encourage a chock of ground material to build up in front of the tyres as they're braked, stopping you more quickly on snow or loose surfaces. Satisfied customers have always liked this Yeti's purposefully understated approach to crossover aesthetics. You'd recognise a degree of low-key SUV-ness here, but not too much. The exact extent of visual ruggedness these days governed by the species of Yeti you decide upon, given that in this revised first generation model lineup, there are two. Those approaching crossover ownership in an expeditionary frame of mind will prefer a variant from the Yeti outdoor range, such as the one that I have here. This car primarily differentiated from the standard model by skid plate style aluminium trim panels at the front and rear as well as black plastic side rubbing strips and front and rear bumpers optimised for the sharper approach and departure angles that characterise off-road use. The design as a whole though hasn't changed very much. Chief designer Josef Kaban contenting himself with a subtle front end restyle that embosses the famous winged arrow badge into the leading edge of the bonnet. A little disappointingly, the previously distinctive prominent round front fog lights have here been replaced by smaller, more conventional rectangular units moved down to the usual position either side of the lower air intake. Still, the overall look does have more of a premium feel, thanks to the smart 17-slat front grille you'll find flanked by more sharply detailed headlamps with their integrated daytime running lights and optional bi-xenon beams. In profile, the square boxy shape with its neat blacked out roof pillars remains largely unchanged, save for the revised side rubbing strips and the smarter alloy wheels that sit below bolder wheel arches. At the rear, where optional LED tail lights can now be specified, cubist triangle elements either side of the number plate forge a visual link to other more recent Skoda designs. This one aims to perform the slightly awkward role of trying to appeal to potential buyers of both small and medium sized crossover models, something especially obvious when you lift the slab sided tailgate and inspect the space on offer in the boot. You can increase this by pushing the rear bench right forward, but you won't want to be doing that too often unless the occupants you're expected to transport there will be below the age of 10. So, with the bench in its usual rearward place, there's 416 litres on offer, a capacity that sits roughly midway between the kind of space you'd get in a class tiddler like a Ford EcoSport or a Renault Captur, and something bigger and family hatch based like a Peugeot 3008 or a Kia Sportage. Now, Skoda would argue that they've got the balance just right, and to be fair, this car's cargo area isn't that far from the size of that you get in a directly comparable Nissan Qashqai or Suzuki SX4 S Cross, and the capacity is actually precisely identical to another direct rival, Mitsubishi's ASX. 
it's perhaps more important to note that this is a very usable space. You get these neat boot rails uh, with shopping bag hooks on either side that uh, slide backwards and forwards. The idea is to be able to hang shopping bags off the floor. Though as you can see, you'd need a bag a lot smaller than the one I have to be able to use it. Now that floor can be one of those uh, neat uh, adjustable height ones that you can use to suit the height of awkwardly high items. But uh, you'll note I haven't got it here because uh, in this case this car is fitted with uh, the optional space saver rear wheel that I would have thought almost anyone would want in preference to the rather fiddly puncher repair kit. Now uh, more effectively thought out is the removable LED boot torch and you can also specify one of those reversible boot floor coverings that you can flip the floor over to better suit the needs of muddy dogs and filthy boots. Uh, now, uh, in terms of extra space, you can push forward the 40, 20, 40 split folding rear seat arrangement to free up a class leading 1760 litres of total fresh air and if you need even more room than that there's the option of specifying a fold flat front passenger seat for the transport of really long items like say a surfboard or a mountain bike. In the corner of the boot here there's space for tying down something precious, uh, space for say a bottle and a 12 volt power socket. Now it's worth saying a little more about this bench because it really is very versatile when it comes to the different permutations it can deliver as part of what Skoda calls its Variaflex seating arrangement. Now this simple to use system allows the seats to be moved forwards or backwards so that rear seat passengers can find the most comfortable position while maximising the cargo space available behind. The seats can also be reclined individually or even completely taken out of the vehicle to release a further 180 litres of space if you're in a removal van frame of mind. That's a unique crossover class feature, but if you opt to take advantage of it, you'll find that the chairs are fiddly to release and cumbersome to move around. Once you get comfortable back here, you might also note the platform positioning that mounts these rear seat bases 20 millimetres higher than those at the front to give rear folk a better view out. Now that sort of thing makes a real difference when it comes to things like child travel sickness. Shoulder rooms are quite good too, certainly better than you get in rival Nissan Qashqai and Suzuki SX4 S cross models and the tall roofline means that headroom is also class leadingly plentiful. You can't get away though from the fact that this car is just 1.8 metres wide, a fact that'll leave three adults seated back here on very friendly terms indeed. Better to seat two and to fold the centre chair down so that they can use the armrests, work surface and cup holders that this seat back provides. Time to exit via the lightweight wide opening doors. The platform seating makes getting in and out of the back a bit easier and see how much work Skoda's designers have done in the cabin with this revised model. Not that much is the answer. The main change that owners of the original version will note is this smarter three-spoke leather trimmed multifunction steering wheel, though the Czech brand also claims to have updated the seat fabrics and added various decorative trim elements to bring the interior closer to quality of the kind that you get in the kind of Volkswagen Tiguan that with exactly the same mechanicals would cost you 15 to 20 percent more. You can even specify artificial wood trim, though I'd urge you not to. As before, the driving position is raised to afford a better view out through the broad windows and tall windscreen, though not so much as to make ownership transition into this car from an ordinary family hatch a daunting prospect. Everything falls to hand easily, though for taller folk the gear stick might be a little easier to reach if it was mounted a bit higher. The centre console is dominated on plusher models by this large infotainment screen, though the system that drives it is older tech than that used in the brand's more recently designed Octavia. Still, everything feels 
of high quality and clever use of different surface textures give a bright spacious feel that can be further emphasised by an optional panoramic glass roof. There's decent practicality too with the usual cup holders, a large glove box and on plusher models like this one a case for your sunglasses and a storage box beneath the front passenger seat. There's also decently sized door bins with elasticated straps and a dash top storage box. Prices for this improved first generation Yeti aren't very much different from what they were before, which means that most models will be sold in the 17 to 27,000 pound bracket. Now the range is split into a couple of parts, the standard Yeti model and the more SUV orientated Yeti outdoor variants. Go for an outdoor version like the one I have here and you'll find there's no premium for the more rugged look which is one of the reasons why 70% of Yeti buyers will go this route. That and the fact that the more powerful petrol and diesel engines are restricted to the outdoor lineup, as, a little more predictably, is the 4x4 drivetrain system. As usual with Volkswagen Group products, a DSG twin clutch automatic gearbox option is available. A 7-speeder on the 1.2-litre petrol and a 6-speeder on the 2-litre TDI 140 diesel for an £1,100 premium in each case. If you're shopping at the bottom of the Yeti range, you'll need to decide whether it's really worth finding the extra £1,500 necessary to move from the petrol 1.2 litre TSI to one of the base diesel options, either the 105 PS 1.6 litre TDI or the 110 PS 2 litre TDI. They cost about the same. So relatively frugal is the petrol variant that for low mileage buyers, it may not be. If you want four-wheel drive though, you'll probably have to have diesel power. Though there's a pricey top-spec petrol 1.8 litre TSI variant offered right at the top of the range, otherwise Yetis with all-wheel drive traction have two litre TDI power plants installed beneath their bonnets, offering a choice of 110, in this case 140 or 170 PS outputs. And to give you an idea of the premium involved for the peace of mind of 4x4 traction, if you were looking at a front-driven 2-litre TDI 110 Yeti, you'd need just over £1,600 more to upgrade it to 4x4 status with the same engine, or around £2,500 more to upgrade it to 4x4 status with Pokia 140 PS power. Now to the value proposition that that kind of pricing represents. First up, you need to be comparing apples with apples. You'll probably be aware that this is what today's market defines as a crossover, a compact family car with a ruggedized look and extra practicality, a segment that in recent times has split into a couple of parts. First, there are models based on super minis, cars like Renault's Capture, Nissan's Duke and Ford's EcoSport. All of these will look a little cheaper than a Yeti, but then they would do because they're smaller inside and feebler to drive. No, to realistically price match this Skoda, you need to be comparing it to the slightly pricier but significantly larger crossovers based on focus sized family hatchbacks. Cars like Nissan's Qashqai, Peugeot's 3008 and Kia's Sportage. Once you do that, it looks very good value. List pricing for the Nissan, Peugeot and Kia models I've just mentioned suggests that they'll set you back around £1,000 more in base petrol and diesel guises and I wouldn't even bother looking at them at all if you want four-wheel drive. Peugeot don't offer it at all, while Kia and Nissan vastly overprice this option. What else? Hyundai's iX35 is a little more affordable, but still pricier than the Skoda, less economic to run and also expensive in four-wheel drive form. And two-wheel drive versions of Vauxhall's Mokka make even less sense, pricey and very small inside. Of course, there are cheaper alternatives to this Czech contender in this segment if you really care to look for them. 
comparably specced diesel versions of the Sanyong Corando and Dacia Duster might deliver respective savings of up to three to four thousand pounds over the cost of an equivalent Yeti. But in return, you'll get a cheaper feeling product with high running costs and rampant depreciation that'll wipe out much of that saving when the time comes to sell. A nicer, more realistic competitor perhaps would be something like a Suzuki SX4 S-Cross or a Mitsubishi ASX. True enough, in petrol form these two start from just £15,000 or so, but both have less total luggage space and will depreciate faster. In diesel and 4x4 guises the Mitsubishi is much pricier too. In other words, it's not hard to see why this Skoda's packaging and pricing might appeal. As I've said, it matches up well to its direct rivals in these regards and is far cheaper than the compact crossovers I haven't mentioned because of their high pricing and more powerful engines. Cars like uh, Ford's Cougar, Mazda's CX-5 and Volkswagen's Tiguan. The Tiguan, in fact, shares some of the Yeti's pokier engines and where direct comparisons exist, the Skoda product is around £3,000 cheaper. That's a big price gap. What it all boils down to is that for potentially less than the kind of money that you might spend on a boring focus sized family hatch and five to six thousand pounds less than you might spend on the cheapest Freelander class compact SUV, you can choose something a lot more interesting with full assurance that the value proposition you bought into is a strong one. Particularly when it comes to standard equipment though it's a pity that you have to pay extra for a hill holder clutch and the useful double-sided boot floor. All models do get alloy wheels, roof rails, daytime running lights, front fog lamps, an alarm, all-round power windows, air conditioning with a pollen filter, Bluetooth phone preparation, a trip computer, and a decent quality four-speaker stereo controllable from the smart leather-covered multifunction steering wheel. Base models, uh, miss out on a few practicalities like the horizontal rails with sliding hooks in the boot, the removable box in the luggage compartment and the removable LED lamp in the boot, though all these of course are fitted further up the range. The real niceties of course, things like uh, leather upholstery, bi-xenon headlamps and power folding mirrors are reserved for plusher models like this one. It's a pity though that across the range you have to pay extra for a space saver rear wheel and you can't have that at all if, as I would want, uh, you opt to pay extra for the useful variable level boot floor. Options I'd want to look at as well as the usual tow bars and roof boxes include a panoramic sunroof, a park assist system and a rear view parking camera to help you into tight spaces and of course satellite navigation though the Columbus sat nav in this case is the slower older tech system that has since been replaced in more modern Volkswagen Group products. I'd also be tempted by practicalities like a fold flat front passenger seat, a partition net screen and folding seat back tables as well as nice to have items like sports seats, stainless steel pedals, keyless entry, a heated windscreen, the 12 speaker stereo system with six disc CD auto changer and the option to personalise things by colouring the roof black, white or silver. If you're looking at a 4x4 Yeti variant, you might well also want to find a little more for the rough road package, which includes an engine guard and an underbody stone guard to make up for the fact that you can't raise the ride height on gnarlier tracks. Lower spec models also make you pay extra for the useful off-road button, which instantly realigns the electronic driver aids for off-piste use. As for safety, well, there are the usual active anti-whiplash front head restraints, twin front side and curtain airbags, plus a driver's knee bag and optional rear side bags. There are Isofix child seat fastenings in the rear too, though it costs extra to have them in the front. Now, building on this are a whole forest of acronyms aimed at trying to make sure that you'll never get into an accident situation in the first place. 
In this day and age, you'd expect ESC stability control and ABS brakes with a HBA hydraulic brake assistant to maximise their effectiveness in emergency stops advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard lights. But this Yeti goes further. Slippery services are dealt with by ASR traction control, MSR engine torque control and an EDS electronic differential lock that will keep all the wheels rotating at equal speeds. Great for when you're trying to pull away and one side of the car is trying to grip on, say, wet leaves, for example. Plus, there's a DSR driver steering recommendation that helps you stabilise a skid and a ESBS electronic stability brake system that dabs the brakes imperceptibly to avoid understeering if you enter a corner too fast. You don't expect any car with any degree of SUV-ness to appeal to eco-minded buyers, but Skoda hope this Yeti will. True, it can't match new generation rivals like Nissan's Qashqai and Suzuki's SX4 S-Cross when it comes to fuel and CO2 returns, but it's still good enough to comfortably see off revised versions of older competitors like Peugeot's 3008, Mitsubishi's ASX, Kia Sportage and Hyundai's iX35 in this regard. Best of the Yeti bunch in terms of frugality is the Greenline 2 diesel model with its 105 PS 1.6 litre TDI engine which manages 61.4 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 119 grams per kilometre of CO2. This is the only variant to get a start-stop system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, stuck at the lights or waiting in traffic. Other eco-minded green line tweaks include a longer final drive ratio that lowers the idle speed and lighter wheels shod with low rolling resistance tyres. Plus there's energy recovery functionality and a lowered ride height for uh, better aerodynamics that incidentally explains why this variant can't be ordered in 4x4 form. Talking of 4x4 Yetis, with this revised model there's a significantly lower running cost penalty than there was before if you choose to go that route. Now that's because the all-wheel drive system uses a 5th generation Haldex clutch system that's now 1.4 kilograms lighter and more efficient. As a result, the returns you get on a two-wheel drive 2-litre TDI 110 diesel Yeti, 55.4 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 134 grams per kilometre of CO2, rise only as far as 47.9 miles to the gallon and 154 grams per kilometre if you specify this variant in 4x4 form. The Pokia 2-litre TDI models only come with 4x4 fitted. Take the 140 PS variant I'm trying here for example, which manages 48.7 miles to the gallon and 152 grams per kilometre, returns that are only marginally affected if you order this engine in 170 PS guise. If you want an automatic variant though, you might want to think twice about diesel power. The DSG twin clutch box diesel variants like this one get is the older, slower acting 6 speed unit, so it'll hit your running cost returns by about 10%. Much better is the 7-speed DSG automatic that makes virtually no difference to the running costs of the 1.2-litre TSI petrol model. In manual gearbox form, that variant delivers 46.3 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 142 grams per kilometre of CO2, so it'll be a better option to diesel power for low mileage motorists. The only other petrol option is the pricey and rarely seen 160 PS 1.8 TSI unit only offered at the top of the range. For the record, this manages 36.2 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 184 grams per kilometre of CO2. What else? Well, in terms of depreciation, the Yeti has so far performed strongly and the evolutionary styling of the facelift car isn't going to significantly damage the resale values of existing owners. Owners who seem to love their cars, this model regularly finishes top of driver satisfaction surveys, which is one reason why residual value predictions suggest that this Skoda should realise up to 48% of its original value after three years and 36,000 miles. Maintenance costs can be kept down by an optional three-year 30,000 mile service plan, 
and there's the option of extending the three-year 60,000 mile warranty to either four or five years. Finally, insurance groupings are set at 12 for the petrol 1.2, 14 for the diesel 1.6, between 14 and 19 for the volume 2 litre TDI 110 and 140 models and group 22 for the range topping 2 litre TDI 170 or 1.8 TSI petrol variants. All the things that made the original Yeti so appealing remain with this revised model. It's spacious, safe, drives well, has a cool but understated image and is affordable to run. This improved version adds a little equipment, tidies the interior and tweaks the styling, but otherwise sticks to a tried and tested recipe. In truth, not a lot needed changing. As before, what we have here is a class act in a market full of try-hard rivals. An act certainly now smartened, if slightly less distinctive, as a result of facelift changes that have bought the option of this outdoor body style. It's there to remind us, perhaps, of this Yeti's rather refreshing penchant for four-wheel drive in a crossover market that, broadly speaking, either resolutely ignores this option or completely overprices it. Though most sales of this car will continue to be of front-driven models, those who do want the extra peace of mind of all-wheel drive traction and don't want to stretch to a pricey Freelander or RAV4 class compact soft roader will find that this Skoda is one crossover that does serve up a wide, affordable choice of 4x4 variants. Cars that have become more efficient and even easier to use off the beaten track thanks to the rough road pack and off-road button options the Czech brand now offers. Whichever form of Yeti motoring you prefer though, you'll get yourself a car that continues to strike an appealing chord between practicality, quality and fashion. No, it's not quite as class leading as it originally was. Some of the rivals it now has to face are larger, more high tech or more efficient. Most of them are pricier too though, and it's that very affordability that'll keep this Skoda in the frame for customers who want a more interesting and flexible alternative to yet another dull, focus-sized family hatch. It's a car that transcends lifestyle snobbery, a family car that doesn't shout family, and a crossover you could be genuinely pleased to own. take notice. On paper, Volkswagen's Touareg does just about everything right. It's a luxury 4x4 without a lottery winner's price tag. It's based on no lesser vehicle than Porsche's Cayenne, so it must have enough design integrity to satisfy customers spending nearly six figures. And in second generation form, it ticks all the current industry buzzword boxes. So it's lighter, yet more fuel efficient. There's even a hybrid.